Hi, welcome to Lindisfarne, or Holy Island as it's known. We're just off the northeast coast of England, virtually on the Scottish border. It's a fantastic place, it's mystical, it's beautiful, and it's chock-a-block full of 1,500 years of archaeology. Holy Island got its name because it was the northern heart of Christianity, but that's not the only reason it was important. Nowhere else in the country, apart from Canterbury itself, played such a vital role in the early conversion of England to Christianity. But a great deal changed when the monks left. The island is dominated by two buildings, the medieval priory and Lindisfarne Castle. They represent the two lives of Holy Island, if you like, because after it ceased to be a centre for Christian monks, it became a military base. There was a garrison here for 250 years. Our job, though, is to investigate a field. This one, in fact. It's right in the middle of the village. It's known locally as the palace, and nobody really knows why. So we've got just three days to find out whether it's part of the island's Christian story, or its military story, or neither, or both. This is it, this is Palace Field, and we've come here because we've been asked to excavate it by the local county archaeologist, Caroline Hardy. Caroline, do we know that there is a palace here? To be perfectly honest, we don't know that there's a palace here. It's called the palace, we don't know why. It's a bit small for a palace, isn't it? Well, it might be, but if you consider that there may have been buildings all the way around the edge, courtyard in the middle, entrance at that end, in fact, it could be quite a substantial medieval property. This is a scheduled site, so we've had to draw up an archaeological plan with Caroline, which means we've already done some geophys, we did that yesterday, and we found that there are things that look like structures here, so it's pretty exciting. I Mick, think so. where are we going to start? Well, we're starting here because there's upstanding walls and we think they're medieval, so we're clearing it up and we're going to start here. You're actually going to put a trench in here? Yeah, we're going to open up the middle, middle of the area and see if there's anything left of this building. <laughs> Although there's never been any archaeological work done on the site, quite a lot's been written about it. But nowhere does it make it clear what it was here that could have been called a palace. Nevertheless, we're going ahead with clearing away the years of accumulated earth and weed, and we're already pretty sure that the stonework we're uncovering is late medieval, over 500 years old. OK then, Ian, let's clean it back. Monks, monasteries and cloisters, this is right up your street, isn't it? It's absolutely fantastic, really. and Holy Island, which is one of the major sites, you know, I can't believe we're here. When did the first monks come here? They came here in 635 under Aidan, who was a monk on Iona, on the other side of... In the West country, Scotland? In West Scotland, yeah. and uh, they were invited here by Oswald, who was the king of Northumbria, who actually had his palace where Bamborough Castle is now, and uh, they set up uh, a monastery here uh, in order to... Uh, Christianise the, the, the people of Northumbria. And is there any evidence of those monks left? No, because it's a sort of monastery like many of the you know, so-called Celtic monasteries where there were little individual cells for the monks, they would have been built of timber probably, there were probably uh, timber chapels and, and, and other timber buildings and it's left really no trace that we can see. So when do the ruins that we can see come into the picture? Well, that early monastery is destroyed by the Vikings in the 9th century, along with so many others. Uh, this one is then a re-establishment in the 12th century. And then this goes out of use in, in the dissolution under Henry VIII in the 1530s. When he closed down all the monasteries? In the end. Holy Island today is very different from what it was in its Christian heyday. The population is 160 now, 
although that number increases hugely in the summer months when thousands of tourists flock here. They're drawn by its beauty and remoteness, by the impressive 17th century castle and by the wonderful ruins of the medieval priory. Now we've started the Digon Palace field, we can set about seeing if the field's connected to the priory. So what do we need to do? I think the answer to that is to look at the area between the two, which really is this lot of gardens down here, because it's possible that, well, it's, it's very likely that this, this area was within the precinct of the medieval monastery, and probably the Anglo-Saxon monastery as well. So I think it's a knocking on doors and, and asking Hello, permissions. Hello, we're from the time team. And it usually works, doesn't it? Um, sometimes, sometimes it works. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> The line of the wall below the gardens is roughly the same as the wall of Palace Field. We think the Priory boundary might have followed this line and turned up the hill past our site. Any medieval buildings inside it would have belonged to the Priory. Our first garden trench is at Beblo Cottage, the home of Tim and Jackie Parkin. They own Palace Field, in fact, and they invited Time Team to dig it up. I don't think they bargained on us turning over their own back garden, though. We think the Priory boundary wall comes down just beyond where all the diggers are, then turns to a right angle, goes just behind the JCB there, and then runs, continues into being the wall at the bottom of your garden. All right. So you might just be within it. And what we really hope is if we open up a little metre test pit, just go down into it, see whether we hit medieval occupation there. Yes, but I must say it's a relief to see that the hole is not too big. Well, if we hit something really interesting, <laughs> brace yourself for us coming back and asking if we can enlarge it. If this was the old priory boundary, it would have had an impressive wall. And if there was a palace inside it, perhaps it was a bishop's palace or even a posh guest house. You get to the corner here that it actually changes to this very substantial plinth. Um, very good squared stonework, unlike the coarse rubble that you've got on the garden wall side. And this shows that although it looks like a garden wall, it's actually the base of a very, very substantial building. You don't put a chamfer like that, a chamfered plinth, onto a garden wall. It's also very, very thick, isn't it? It must be uh, well over a metre. Does that signify anything? Um, just that it's a very substantial building, high quality building, um, something that a lot of money went into. At our incident room at St Cuthbert's Church, Stuart's sifting through the archive of records and maps we've brought from Berwick Record Office. Is it possible to say whether uh, the plots that we're working on were within the monastic precinct or not? Well, the established wisdom on this site at the moment is that the monastic boundary follows this line here, up this road, along Marygate, and then back down along the foreshore the abbey just being in here. So that would mean that we're in the northeast corner of that then? That's right. There are, there are lots of maps and documents actually which also give us clues as to what's going on up there. In 1548 there's a survey done for some proposed military works around That's the priory. Nice, isn't it? It's lovely isn't it? But you can see how there's a priory there. Yeah. This complex of buildings oh, shown yes. up here within yes. that plot, as it were, yeah. what appears to be like a courtyard with ranges of buildings around it and two circular structures within it. Well, that's very interesting because they yeah. could be kilns or ovens. I think it's certainly a possibility, yeah. Yeah, there's an awful lot to go at. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Then. Well, we've got the as well as the upstanding walls on our site, we're looking for buried buildings. John's Geophys results suggest we might have two buildings of different dates butting up against each other. And we've got the high resistance in black showing the building in the corner. Yeah. Uh, and then other divisions in the buildings along this edge. Doesn't that correspond with the change in the wall along there anyway? Can, yeah. we, can we see that? Uh, yes. In the, yeah. the wall itself? Yeah. I mean, it's far clearer on the other side. Well, we can peer over, can't we? You can see it quite clearly. I mean, yeah, look, it's sticking out about 18 inches. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's very clear, isn't it? And so you the responses we've got are sort of in this area. 
so high resistance suggesting rubble and then it stops at this point and so, so we're into another right, building. Okay, so what are you thinking of Richard? Something coming coming out from here? Yeah, we need a trench I think that basically straddles this junction perhaps five metres or so into the into the field. That's roughly what okay. the geophysics yes. is telling us about the width of certainly the building that's behind okay. me. Well, let's get the digger in and start that and then we'll have another chat when the radar's ready. The radar's done. Okay, I'll come back and see you when that's ready. So about, what, five, six by four? Yeah, six by four, I think. Oh, here you are, Ian. You've got your own private hole. Meanwhile, in our little yeah, trench at Beblo Cottage, we've struck lucky. Ian's found a large structure so and pottery that could date it. from the Priory. Well, we've, got, we've certainly got the front of a wall coming through there. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I haven't got the back yet. Right. So it, it could be quite, quite, quite substantial. Quite a yeah. size. Oh, what sort of date's the pottery then, Jenny? Well, this biggest piece here is a, a reduced green glaze ware, which um, late medieval, 15th oh, right. century. That's um, good. And there's um, a couple of bits of this buff, quite thin, thin fabric with, with the throwing ridges with, that with you can see. With lines across it, yeah. yeah. But um, possibly from a um, perhaps 13th century cooking pot or jar. 13th uh, century? Could be. Right. Trench one's coming along. Phil and his team have been really hard at it all morning and a large amount of this strange structure is now visible. And we've also been examining the surrounding landscape. Stuart seems to think that the 1548 map suggests there was water all the way up to our site. Since then, of course, it's silted up, leaving a wide field where there was once an estuary. So years and years ago, would the sea have come right up to there? It would, right up to the edge of this steep scarp you can see curving round here. It will lapped up along the base of the garden walls you can see, and round the edge of the palace field over there. It would have been a, a basin of water which came in, see where the boat is on the jetty? Yeah. And a narrow gap coming through there, and the basin separated from the sea by a shingle ridge, and the herring houses there, the, the buildings of the red roofs. Yeah, yeah. There's a shingle bank along there which would have separated out this area of water from the sea. And so was that why it silted up? That's right. It would have been a bay with water going right the way along the edge to the edge of the palace site. So you would have had tidal water right the way up to, to where we're digging. So if tidal water came up to our site, it seems likely that shallow draft boats could have moored there as well. And the 16th century map raises the possibility that the structure we're uncovering on our site was a harbour building. The question is, what was it? Crikey, Phil, this is... Phil's hard work seems to be paying off, and what we're finding in this corner of the field looks very similar to what's drawn on the old map. This here is the building that's shown on this plan of 1548. Look, there's this round yeah. oven thing, which is... That one around there. Yeah. And then here is the central wall. Which is... Which is that there. Yeah. And then around there is this other... Well, I've been calling it an oven. So do you think this is um, an actual bakehouse in here? I mean, are we looking at a, an oven here for putting the loaves well, in? Well, that's what I've been calling it, but, but John seems to think it might actually be part of the brewing John. process. Come, you come and give us your explanation. Uh, the only reason I said that I thought it might be a brew house is that a couple of years back uh, I looked at Lake Hock Abbey in Wiltshire. Oh, yeah. yeah. And there the 16th century brew house survives. Yeah. And there the brew house has very large stone bases with the vats on top with burning underneath where the heat comes from. Right. And there is a certain amount of evidence for, for burning here, isn't there? Not a huge amount. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that if you had bread ovens, you have a lot more heat. Mm -hmm. And actually, I mean, given the size of them, that's a lot of bread to be baking. I'd actually rather imagine that quantity of beer. Yes. I, I prefer <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> this is a puzzling sight, with different things going on here in different periods of history. No evidence for a palace at all yet, and we haven't connected the site to the Priory. But it's early days, and we're making good progress. We've already found out that at some time in the past, the palace field was used as a brewery or bakery. And out in the gardens, we're down to the medieval levels. And tomorrow, with a bit of luck, 
will be where our story first started, the Anglo-Saxon period. By the end of day one, we were pretty certain that this area of the palace had been converted either into a bakery or a brewery in the 1540s. Now, that's after the time that Henry VIII dissolved the Priory, but it's round about the time that he began building up Britain's coastal defences. So, does that mean that there was military activity going on here? John, were there Tudor soldiers here? were sailors primarily, and there were forts dotted along the coast, um, small blockhouses, bulwarks. But this area here, I view as a sort of naval supply depot. What sort ships. of supplies? Well, munitions, gunpowder, cannon shot. I mean, the firm thing we have is this 1590 survey, which says over 1,000 cannon shots stored in this in this area. What does 1,000 cannon shot mean? Is that a lot? Well, or a you could, it depends on your size of ship, obviously. But for uh, six or seven vessels of varying size, that could sort of supply in one go for a, for a major engagement. Holy Island was important because it was on the border with Scotland. Throughout the 1500s, England felt under threat from the Scots and also from the Spaniards, so it was vital to create a northern supply base to supplement those in the south. And just at the right time, Phil's found our first military clue. I think I've just found a cannonball. Look at that. Doesn't that look like a cannonball? Well, oh, it's possible, I suppose. This may be the first bit of evidence that they had a naval base on this site in the 1500s. We now know there was a new brew house and bake house here in 1559, so perhaps that was part of the base. But we still want to know if earlier on in the Middle Ages there were monastic buildings from here to the Priory, so we're continuing digging at Beblo Cottage, where events have taken a rather bizarre twist. Out of this trench. Oh, there's the wall. What the hell is that? It's a horse. Good Lord. You can see it, someone that's its jaw, nose. Teeth. There's its backbone, yeah. pelvis, and some of the long bones, the forelimbs. It's been butchered and it's burnt at the bottom there. It's been eaten. That's weird, isn't it? I mean, that is really unusual, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yes, I mean, I've never understood why people don't eat horses, but I mean, they don't, do they, no. by and large? I mean, you find heads deposited, you know, you find whole skeletons buried. But that's always either trying to get rid of a dead horse or they're buried with human burials as a yeah. sort of favoured animal or something. Yeah, you a status don't get, symbol or something like that. You yeah. don't get them eaten. So, I mean, presumably there's been endless speculation as to <laughs> as to why this is has been eaten and buried here. Well, we wondered if oh yeah, dodgy butcher selling yes, it off as yes. beef, or maybe does the island get cut off in a bad storm every winter when they had to eat a horse? Or what about the wall itself? Because I mean, this is a a substantial structure. I mean, have you got any idea date for this now? Well, it's completely different to all the other walls I've seen because yeah. this one doesn't have any mortar in it. Oh, right. It's oh, clay right. bonded. It's clay bonded. Would that be anything? The, the only thing I would say that I mean, when I came up and saw it the other day, it looked to me as if it was on a diff completely different alignment mm. to everything else that we've got in the site uh, over there, or indeed the layout and alignment of the village. I think if it is wildly off alignment, we'd have to flag it as possibly Saxon. It's possible, certainly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The horse is too high up in the soil to be really old, but what a curious find. This morning, we decided it would be a good idea to open up more of the ground between our field and the priory. So we asked the owners of the house two doors down if we could put a trench in their garden. Almost immediately, Carenza dug up large chunks of stone. Let's just have a look at them as they come yeah. up. Just... I mean, they're definitely reused masonry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. They'll have to remove all this reused stone before they can begin the serious task of establishing whether the occupational layers go back to medieval times and the medieval priory. If there really was a palace on Palace Field, it would have been impressive. So we're trying to find evidence of high status buildings and perhaps courtyards. Well, you're asking if we'd got anything in the middle. Now, if we come yeah. over here, I've actually marked it out already. Yeah. Um, John's been getting some results down at the southern end of the site, which Caroline thinks may have been the medieval entranceway. Not as strong, but look at those. So could this actually be the remains of the medieval gatehouse into the medieval courtyard? You'd have to dig it. <laughs> that would right, be well, nice, wouldn't it? That, I think that's a good idea then. OK, so two trenches. Get the machine in now. 
do a bit at a time. Just dip a little bit at a time and just nibble into it if you can. In the estuary field below the gardens, we're doing a bit of carpentry. We've got two staves here that have already been done. These are all Bread done. or beer or gunpowder, it was all kept in barrels. Phil's taking a break from digging to see how they used to make barrels and to lend a hand to Jim Newlands, our time team cooper. The narrower on the inside than they are on the outside, so as you then create your circle. So they don't they leak? Yeah. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we're going to hollow out the inside of the, the stave, so right. it makes it easier for bending. Right. You won't risk Barrels have been the principal method of storing and transporting goods for over 4,000 years. They were used in ancient Egypt, and it was the Romans who first brought barrels to Britain. The word cooper comes from the Latin for barrel maker, cuparius. It's a highly skilled job, and the apprenticeship to become a cooper takes five years in contrast to Phil's five minutes. Remember and keep it smooth. Oh, I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you're having absolute apoplexy watching me ruin a perfectly good piece of oak. The 1548 plan, which we've all been using, shows not only our field with its bakery or brewery, but also the outlines of some proposed fortifications. Stuart's intrigued by these, and he's trying to find out more about them. What I'd like you to do, if you could, mm -hmm. is take this 1548 server that shows the priory and the palace area and these supposed fortifications around, mm -hmm. and see if you can lay them against the modern ordnance survey map for me, if you can get them roughly at the same scale. Can you yeah. do that? OK. It may be that the fortification plan actually affected the layout of the streets. While Maya's sorting out the maps on her computer, Stuart's joined Mick in the chopper to see if they can identify any fortifications from the air and relate them to our site on the ground. I mean, on the end of this, this what do you pronounce it, the hue or the hoof? Or well, I think it's hue, but I'm probably completely hey, oh, wrong right. on that one. <laughs> You've got a little, little fort on the end of there, haven't you, That's as well? Right. Well, that, that's Osborne's fort, and it's actually later in date than the, the palace. It's 1670, 1671, right. that sort of date. But what, it, it's in the same place as a battery shown on the 1548 map, so clearly they had a defence work of some, right. um, some extent on there yeah, at the time. Yeah. I mean, that would provide a superb defence with the, the harbour turning back in. Presumably with the castle on the other side. That's right. Again, in the 1548, where Lindisfarne Castle is now, isn't there isn't a battery there. There right. is a, a smaller series of bulwarks further seaward of it. Yeah. Uh, but Lindisfarne Castle again comes later on in the 17th century. And that's part and parcel why the defences weren't adequate. Right. And clearly they were thinking of re-fortifying all the area around the priory yeah. because they're standing structures there yeah. in masonry, ideal point of storage. Yeah. The site it rely reminds me of is St Mary Grace's in London, right. which is a Cistercian monastery that as soon as it was dissolved, within a matter of uh, ten years, was turned into a naval victualling yard. I see. And they were using the buildings to store food and ammunition and guns oh, right. and everything to supply the ships who ca that came up to London. Well, that's exactly what they were doing here well, at the Priory, wasn't this, it? This, I think, is a, a mini yeah. version of that. Yeah, yeah right. I'm sure it's the same sort of idea. And I really wonder whether the big, thick wall at the bottom isn't some sort of gun battery. Right. And then the palace is a reference to perhaps uh, the big house in which the, the governor, for the want yeah. of a better word, lived. Right. Overlooking the harbour. Yeah. So this suggests our field could have had buildings on the harbour and been a navy supply base for food, drink and ammunition. Although our military expert, John Kenyon, seems to have some doubts about that cannonball Phil found. It's quite rough, usually, especially with this bump on this side here. Yes, that's usually stone shot, even for some of the crude breech loaders, as is a nice, good spherical ball. Yeah. Um, if I was a master gunner loading up my gun, I'd be slightly worried. I'd sort of like the fuse and do a runner, <laughs> um, in case the whole thing blew up in my face. But then it's difficult to see what else it, it could be. 
clay in there just means that the, the wall has been substantially rubbed out. And Phil and Jim are now busy with the heads, which is the name they give to the lid and the bottom of the barrel. It's a lovely tool, I mean. It's... Technically, these are casks, not barrels, because a barrel is a particular kind of cask that holds 36 gallons. Phil and Jim are making the heads for a cask that takes 18 gallons, called a kilderkin. Is that about it? Yeah. And then you just scrape it up, and there, <laughs> and out it comes. This plan of 1540. Stuart's finished his study of the street plan of Holy Island Village, and matching it with the historical map has paid off. But if you look here, for instance, look at that very odd angle across there and the angle of that road. Compared with that angle? Exactly, yeah. yep. This is great news. Everyone thought the defences were never built, but this arrow-headed earthwork must have been sufficiently developed that it was easier for the street to follow the angle than to level the ground and start again. And what's more, the earthwork around the Priory still exists. You can see this scarp we're walking along here? Yeah. This seems to be part of the defences around the harbour. It's entirely man-made. It is, yep. And you see the what looks like a spoil heap ahead of you? Yeah. That is actually a bulwark. It's like a gun platform sticking out over the end to protect this end of the, of the uh, Priory site over here. How do you know that this is part of the defences? Because you get lots of earthworks like this round towns defended in the 16th century. It's very typical of the early type of defences like you have at Berwick, for instance. Oh, that looks all right. Look at that. Well, the day's fast disappearing. And how's Carenza's garden going? Yes, we're starting to make progress now. We've had quite a, uh, a difficult day. We were looking for a wall, but it turned out just to be modern stuff on top of modern and Victorian garden stuff. So we had smarty tops and old broken dolls and china and whatnot. Um, but we're now down onto real archaeology and we're just cleaning back here. This is an occupation there here. But we did start to wonder how much further we were going to have to go down before we got anything really early. So we took advantage of the fact that the people in the house have been digging this pond or something where they'd got down to this level already and we've gone right down. And you've come up with three plastic bags. <laughs> That's stratigraphy. Uh, what does it tell us? That's 18th century pottery. Yeah. That's 17th century pottery. And right down there, that's medieval pottery. So that's 500 years of Lindisfarne. And the great thing is that that's telling us that hopefully the same layers will be in our main trench. And if we carry on down, we'll find medieval layers and hopefully even Saxon layers below them. Back on the main site, trenches two and three are coming on very rapidly. We've already started to uncover an extensive cobbled floor, which might have been the stable yard for a medieval house. Not sure about a palace, though. And over at our brew house or bake house, Phil's back at work. Hello, Tony. Yesterday you said to me, this place is either somewhere to do with brewing or somewhere to do with baking. And I'm overjoyed to be able to say, I'm pretty sure it's brewing. What a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that? Well, one thing that we are all agreed on is that when you do the brewing process, you need two vats. One would have been in that circular area there, mm. and the other one underneath John there. That seems pretty compelling, doesn't it? John, what would these vats have been used for? Well, actually, we think that the whole place has started up the hill, where the, the large building is in the corner of the site. Over here? Yeah, right, right at the top. Yeah. You can see the big stone building in the corner. There, yeah. And you can see the beam slots along the ground and this ledge along this side. These slots yeah. near the ground here, Running yeah. along just above the ground level. Yeah. There was a very, very sub solid floor in there, and it's possible that that's where they were germinating, uh, molting the barley spilling the barley out, adding water, getting it to germinate, then bringing it down the site. Yeah. And the first vessel then would be your, um, your mashing tun. Yeah. It would have had about 1,500 gallons 
at one time of hot water with the mash added to it, after about two hours, it would have been transferred to the fermentation vat. Again, another huge half barrel with all that liquid in sitting on these very solid stone walls here. And if you look over here, we think we might have actually found a stoke, stoke hole. You see here, we've got stonework there and look through there is this burnt area that's carrying on and possibly coming up in the floor. Really? So will it be like a flue? Is that what we're Well, that, that, that ought to be how it worked. If you've got to keep all this liquid hot, then you've got to keep the temperature up in one or other of these. And presumably you've got a fire out here with a cauldron or something, heating that water, which you're then transferring into it. So, second day done, and still nothing we can call a palace. We've confirmed that we've got our brewery, and it's quite likely that that was part of the naval supply yard at the end of the 16th century. But what was here that might have been called a palace? And when? Was it 16th century or medieval? There's a lot to do on day three. We're still no further forward with what this place looked like in the Middle Ages, and that has to be the priority for our last day. So tomorrow, the big news is we're going to dig here, right in the middle of the field. We haven't been able to geophys it because of all this concrete and stones, but we've decided to go for a big trench here anyway, so that hopefully tomorrow we'll be able to find the medieval and maybe even the Saxon history of Palace Field. Start of day three. This so-called Palace Field still puzzling us we know there was a brewery here in the 1500s and that that was part of a naval base supplying visiting ships with food and ammunition. But so far, we can't explain what was called the palace. We assume the answer lies earlier than 1500, so we want to find medieval buildings. First thing this morning, we opened a large trench which will run from the western wall into the middle of the field. And at our brewery too, we're going for the medieval. We can't dig up the brew house floor itself because the archaeology is too valuable. But we've put a trench in to one side of it. Over in Carenza's garden as well, they've been desperately trying to find evidence of occupation in the Middle Ages. Now that Jenny's had a chance to look at the bags of pottery fragments, it's clear they're giving us a pretty mixed picture. 19th century mostly, 18th century mostly, 17th century and then, mostly. So, <laughs> this and you is get our it, lowest. And that's your lowest one. And yes, and now here, the first bits uh, that I, my eye caught are, are the medieval, uh, the reduced green glaze. But then, we were really excited when we well, found them. Yes, that. <laughs> that's right. But then you are getting them mixed with um, clay pipes, which are not, they're not very early clay pipes. They're sort of back end of the 17th century. So what sort back of date? Si 1675, 80, something like that. Well, at least there is medieval pottery. We were beginning to wonder if we'd find anything medieval here at all. Now that we have, it's definitely worth Carenza carrying on with this trench. I'll get you to give me a lift on with it. So just Jim and Phil have shaped the top of the barrel, but it seems that the bottom is more complicated. Now you'll wet the inside with a cloth or a sponge to stop it from burning. You just want to heat it up. So what's the point of heating it up? So this will help pull all the, the staves in in the bottom. So if you tried to close them in just now, it wouldn't happen. You would just break all the staves. So the heat actually softens the wood. And then you can put on your other hoops, these, and knock them up the same as we did with this one. Pull it all together. I mean, is it the actual smoke? I mean, you're not actually got a raging inferno. No, in no, there. it's just the, the heat and the steam. Steam? Yeah, that helps make the wood a lot more supple to bend, bend it back in. And how long does it have to stay like this? About two, two and a half hours. I'll see you in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure they're all wet all the way down. We've been trying to establish whether this wall, which goes from our site back to the Priory, could mark the monastic boundary, either in the medieval period or even in the Anglo-Saxon. We thought that digging was the only way to find out. But Stuart and Deirdre O'Sullivan have made a surprisingly simple discovery in the field behind the Priory. Oh yeah, yeah it's, it's got a carving on it, isn't on it? both sides. Yeah, and there's another one further down here, just on the 
the crest of the old shoreline. So what do you think these stones might be? Well, they look to me as if they're perfect. Well, they're in a bang straight line with the boundary. That oh, looking, here it is. That's it, yeah. That one's a lot older. It's more, it's more eroded. Yeah. It's obviously been around for a long time and it has had a carving on this side, but it's well, it's well worn. Now what I think they are, you need to look at the map really to, to see it. The two stones we've got, one's actually marked on the map and they're in the straight line of that boundary. So this looks, these two, two stones are marking the division yeah. between the town side and the church side. Which would mean definitely that the palace field is outside the Priory Grail. Of the medieval Priory, yeah. yes. The stones that Stuart found proved that the boundary ran here, a long way south of our site and also of the gardens we've been digging. Our idea that the gardens might produce finds linking our field to the Priory is wrong. Whatever the gardens do give us, it won't be monastic. And that also means we won't find anything monastic in the field itself either. In that case, what kind of medieval building could have been here? So if our field wasn't in the monastic boundary in the medieval period, what was it? Just something to do with the village? Well, th th that's the most likely because in the 15th century we get a reference to a property coming to a chap called Harbottle, which is at the north end of Finkel Street, which is this street coming up here, and which backs onto Shadwood, which we know is the in the harbour over here. And so the assumption is that it's these two plots in there. And the later house on that site is called Farm View, which is that building along the front of the street there. So does that mean that the palace field, or whatever we're going to call it, was twice as big in those days? It looks as if that's the way, because they describe it as two plots. So what the locals call the palace today might be only part of a larger medieval property called Harbottle Place, extending from the high-status wall with the chamfered plinth at the bottom, all the way up the hill to modern-day Fenkel Street. I went with John Heward up to Farn View to see if there was any evidence on the ground that the medieval records were describing this particular plot. Do you reckon this could be Harbottle Place? I mean, it looks Georgian to me. Well, we're on Fenkel Street at the top end of our site. It's one of the main ways up to the monastery. Um, it's a very substantial house, and although it looks Georgian, you can see hit from here how often they have to replace the stonework. And when you come down to the bottom, you've got this Georgian plinth, shallow, thin, square-topped, just literally tacked on. Come across to here, and you've got this chamfered stone, like the one we had at the bottom of the end of the plot. Um, it's a substantial block of stone that goes back into the wall, and the house is built on top of it much, much earlier. Um, what we can say is, although it looks Georgian, it's got a, a very much more substantial house at the core, a much earlier house at the core, and yes, it could be the site of Harbottle Place. Nothing that we're turning up adds to the medieval picture. All the finds from our four huge trenches confirm activity here in the 16th and 17th centuries, as a military base and as a brewery. And our metal detectors are finding further evidence of its military history. In particular, they've been turning up assorted bits of lead shot. In this one's pistol shot, our experts tell us that in fact it might not have been fired because you can still see the moulding around the edge there. And Jenny's been working her way through trays of pottery farms. This piece here, um, first sight uh, German stoneware, but it's, it's a sort of um, oh, pattern that I haven't seen before. It's actually a person. Gosh, look at the collars. Which is a very... Um, it's a 17th century style of dress. Yes. Do we know what sort of vessel it's from? Well, we've well, looked through um, our reference book here and there are some straight-sided tankards here uh, <laughs> with figures on them and it looks as if, and when you hold that up, you think, well, yes. It is that, that maybe. yes. So it could be a beer tank. Maybe it's from some, a beer tank. From a beauty. Side, <laughs> yes. Keep your hammer, we'll just turn it over onto there. Is it hot? It'll be slightly oh. warm. The steaming seems to have worked, and Phil and Jim are now able to draw together the staves at the bottom of the kilderkin. I'll just give it a knock down for a right. start. It's all yours. 
barrels are the shape they are to make for easy storage, and also because they can then be rolled along a quay to a boat, for instance. One amazing thing, once the contents have been used, the hoops can be lifted off and the barrel will come apart, like a flat pack, which can be reassembled when it's next needed. Brilliant, isn't it? That's it. In Carenza's garden, they're still valiantly struggling to reach a secure medieval layer. Carenza's dug down about as far as she safely can, and she thinks she's finally made a breakthrough. We've got a coin after shifting uh-huh. five tons, is it? Oh, I think about five tons, yeah. Five tons or so, we've got a coin. Right. It's quite irregularly stamped, it's sort of off-centre, so we were hoping it might be early. We're hoping we're out of the medieval layers here. <laughs> right. Well, it's copper alloy, which doesn't immediately suggest medieval. Oh. Um, it is covered with corrosion products. Does that mean it's rusty so you can't see? Yes, but I can make out the word letters C-A-R. Oh, Carenza. Um, well, I think more like the Carolus. Charles. Yeah, and I would have thought Probably Charles I, so we're probably looking at a date between 1625 and 1649. That'll be um, 17th 17th century. century. (laughs) Well, that looks like the end of our garden research. Five tonnes of soil, and we're still stuck in the 1600s. Over on our field, the cobbled floor has now been dated, and sure enough, it's 16th century which puts it fairly and squarely in the Tudor life of our site. I was wondering if Mick could explain why we still haven't found a single medieval building. I can't help thinking that we're right on the edge of the village here in the Middle Ages. And it wouldn't surprise me if there wasn't some sort of house at the top end, perhaps the one that's documented from the 15th century and so on, but that over this area, running down to where the, the estuary was, could well have been gardens or, or orchards or something like that. So if this was just medieval garden plots, why did people suddenly decide to build a big building on it? Well, I think that's something to do with the development of the place uh, as a naval base, really. If you used this as a place to bring your ships in, to get out of the storms in the North Sea and so on, the centre of that big arc is actually this plot here. Yeah, yeah. So you're actually building something impressive to dominate the landscape here as the boats come in? Yeah, and and below would be where you'd beach your ships, or if they were bigger than that, they'd be riding in in the harbour here. And I would imagine this, I mean, possibly even with some sort of terrace at the bottom overlooking the sea. I'm sure it was designed to look impressive. So, it's one hand underneath there, and one hand on the top there. Yeah. He's really got stuck into this barrel making. They're well on the way to finishing. Phil has to create a groove inside the top edge so that the head will sit tight inside the barrel. OK, we're ready for the head. Oi! Right, so it goes... Can't. goes opposite the bung. If you're wondering why it doesn't leak, it's because the staves are wedge-shaped and when the liquid's put in, the wood expands to seal the gaps. <laughs> Just testing. How does that look? Well, there's one thing that strikes me. How are we going to actually put the beer into it? What a hole. Right. <laughs> Niall, is that a ditch you've got there? No, Tony, it's actually a large medieval rubbish pit. How do you know it's medieval? Well, we've taken a half section down through it and taken the material out. Everything we've had out of it so far has been genuine medieval pottery, no modern. And here it is. It's mainly 13th and 14th century pottery that we've got out of here. So is this stone medieval too? No, the stone's a real surprise. Um, That takes you a long way back. We're looking at late Neolithic or early Bronze Age. Really? It's completely out of its earlier situation. Now, how do you know? It looks just like any other stone to me. Well, the face on this side has got two little... uh, Cup marks oh, into it, carved, carved into it. What are they for? Ah, uh, well, I'm not sure I can tell you what they were for. I can tell you where they're from. They tend to occur in Northumberland, Durham, southwest of Scotland, so we know that. They tend to occur in uh, context with prehistoric burials, and so archaeologists often refer to them as being associated with ritual monuments, but I'm afraid in archaeological terms that really often means we don't know. Are there likely that there are any more of these rings further along it? Quite possibly from other examples, but the best way to find out is to have a look. Yeah, very shallow, but it's there. Right, three. One, 
Isn't four. that another one there? Looks yep, like it's it. four. Yep, it's four, four cut marks. Brilliant. Well, you said you wanted medieval. We've got your prehistoric. Well, oh, brilliant, thank you. OK, so we found a Neolithic cupstone and a medieval rubbish pit, but I think we've solved the mystery of Palace Field. The important phase was post-medieval. In the 15 and 1600s, the new buildings must have formed part of a large and impressive site, and it's likely that's why it was nicknamed the Palace, not because it was ever a real palace. At the end of the 17th century, this site would have been buzzing. Beer was being made, great piles of ammunition stood waiting for an engagement, and whatever was needed by the Navy was thrown into barrels and rowed out to the gunships in the harbour. It would have been a Portsmouth of the North. You couldn't believe just how much effort, work, labour and craftsmanship it goes to make one of these things. I'm amazed, really am amazed. Does it affect the taste of the oh, beer? Oh, you though? bet. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Yes, walk on. Mm. It's fine! <laughs> <laughs> See you later! <laughs> And the historical intrigue continues after the break on Discovery Channel when we look back to the Gallipoli disaster of World War I. What caused such large-scale loss of life? Battlefield Detectives is next.